We can now bring in Michael Carpenter, the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for speaking to us here on France 24. Now, the OSCE has reported some 600 ceasefire violations yesterday on Thursday, more ceasefire violations today. Who, are, who is responsible for these violations? Because pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine are calling for civilians to, to leave to Russia. Well, thank you for having me. Most of the ceasefire violations that we're seeing are being perpetrated by the Russian-led forces in the non-government controlled areas. And the shelling of the kindergarten uh, yesterday was almost certainly perpetrated uh, by forces operating in non-government controlled areas. Uh, and what you're seeing today uh, with some of these announcements about evacuations is exactly what we have been predicting for many days now, and you played the clip of Secretary Blinken addressing the UN Security Council. Uh, this is what we see as Russia's effort to create a pretextual basis uh, for its military incursion into Ukraine. And so we have to be very, very vigilant with the facts right now as we look at what's happening in Ukraine. You know, early estimates uh, showed that Russia had amassed around 130,000 uh, troops on the border with Ukraine. Do we know how many troops are there today on the border with Ukraine? So our estimate is between 169,000 and 190,000 Russian troops. That would be in Belarus, on the Russian border with Ukraine, in occupied Crimea. Uh, and then, of course, they've got a sizable naval presence in the seas of Azov and in the Black Sea. Yeah, Mr. Ambassador Doug Herbert here. Um, you use the word, a uh, key word, estimate. Um, I find it interesting that we don't know the exact number of troops taking part in these exercises. Has the OSCE a solicited information uh, about the number of troops? And if so, have you gotten any answers in return? Because my understanding is it's simply a matter of transparency under international conventions. You're absolutely right, and that's a great question, because we have had two meetings this week uh, calling Russia to account for these very unusual and unscheduled military activities and maneuvers. Um, and the first meeting uh, was held on Tuesday, and then today there was a follow-up meeting, an extraordinary joint session of the Permanent Council at the OSCE and the Forum for Security Cooperation. Russia did not show up. Uh, it is simply incredible. It is not credible to believe that this vast number of troops is somehow below the threshold set in the Vienna document for notification of other states uh, regarding unusual military activities. So Russia has provided zero transparency. It has completely disrespected this uh, confidence building measure, the Vienna document, and it has shown disrespect to the entire membership of the OSCE by just simply not showing up at these two meetings, not answering any questions uh, regarding the number of troops and when they will return to their peacetime locations. So uh, let me uh, you play the devil's advocate for a second. You used the words uh, cited by the Russians. Uh, it's in the document, I believe, unusual military activity. So I presume the Russians respond by saying, uh, we don't have to report this because this doesn't qualify as unusual military activity. How do you respond to that? Well, they haven't said anything because they really haven't responded to our requests. But you're right. They would claim that this is not an unusual military activity. But listen, when you've got uh, close to 180 or 190,000 combat-ready troops together with uh, combat aircraft, attack helicopters, electronic warfare systems, artillery, uh, where you're surging ammunition and surging blood supplies to the border, you tell me, is that normal uh, activity or is that unusual? Uh, we think it's highly destabilizing and escalatory. How could I just ask you a simple question? I, I was in I was in that eastern region, you know, at the very outset of this conflict. It wasn't very easy um, for us as journalists to move around. Lots of these checkpoints, um, you know, uh, around that territory. How are your monitors at this point in time? How would you qualify the ease of their mobility, uh, their ability, their movements to get around and to essentially do their jobs? Yeah. So you've got two different stories in the government-controlled areas, the special monitoring mission is able to move freely and has reported no unusual activities. In the non-governmental controlled areas of eastern Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, uh, there is significant restrictions on the ability of the SMM to move around and to conduct their mission, frankly. Who's restricting that movement, in your opinion? It, it, well, it's very clear. There's only one actor. It's the Russian-led forces.
Uh, Mr. Ambassador, earlier you said that pro-Russian uh, forces uh, were uh, responsible for the ceasefire violations. And given that we have Russian separatists calling for the evacuation of civilians, is this the false flag operation that the U.S. Secretary of State was referring to? Uh, it's possible that this is one of many operations, one of many disinformation operations that uh, the Russian-led forces or that Russia will conduct over the coming days. Uh, this doesn't appear as of yet to be a false flag operation, although that could change in the coming hours or days. Uh, but certainly this disinformation that is being sown in the public arena, saying that there is an imminent attack and forcing people to evacuate is nonsense. I think the Ukrainian side has said very clearly they have no intention of escalating the situation. They're not the ones that have uh, close to 190,000 troops massed and uh, in a strike force ready to attack. It's the other side. It's Russia that has assembled that force. You know, so, uh, sorry to we, interrupt. So we you were expecting this, and now it's and now we're watching as it plays out. You know, the U.S. has opted for a very interesting strategy uh, during this this whole crisis. That is to share intelligence on a potential Russian invasion. In your opinion, has that strategy paid off, given that we are at this stage on the precipice of war? Well, we are leaving no stone unturned in trying to avert war and create the space for diplomacy and de-escalation. Unfortunately, the Russian side has shown no interest in uh, diplomacy and dialogue, at least here in the OSCE. Uh, and, you know, we'll have to test that in the coming days. But uh, but but clearly there is uh, a desire on the other side to continue to mount this threatening posture against Ukraine. Um, yeah, I, I was speaking to uh, Fiona Hill on our air uh, just uh, just yesterday, and uh, she was very explicit that she believes Vladimir Putin can essentially act uh, how he chooses, whenever he chooses. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, clearly, if President Putin gives the order, uh, Russia has assembled a massive force uh, that can invade Ukraine. Uh, to your earlier question, we have tried everything, including sharing all the information that we're getting about the various ploys that Russia is employing as, as pretextual fabrications to try to uh, create a casus belli. To, to make that more difficult for them. At the end of the day, of course, President Putin can give the order and, um, and Russian forces can march into Ukraine. Now, we have also prepared massive and unprecedented costs and consequences together with our EU and G7 partners uh, that are ready to go in that event. Of course, that's not what we want to see happen because that's a disaster for all of us. We would rather see uh, diplomacy as the path forward. Mr. Ambassador, given that you have all those sanctions ready and waiting to go, why not trigger those sanctions, given that, you know, the U.S. has been saying over the past few days, an attack is imminent, it's coming, it's coming in the next few days. Why not trigger the sanctions and, and avoid that from happening? Well, I, I don't see the logic in that, frankly. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is sharpen the choices for the Kremlin. On the one hand, offer them this path of diplomacy and de-escalation, uh, and then on the other, telegraph that there will be massive consequences if they invade. If you if you start to impose those consequences before, uh, then that uh, lessens the deterrent factor of those sanctions. So you're saying diplomacy is still on the table in spite of... Absolutely. From our perspective, we would uh, be very interested in engaging in further uh, diplomatic talks. Uh, but it remains to the other side to see if they want to engage.